Hi, I'm Eric Ford for Made Here. Since its inception in 1916, the Big E has been a showcase for New England agriculture and industry. Directed by David Frazier from New England Public Media, 100 Years on the Avenue, the story of the Big E uses archival materials, interviews with historians and staff, and current day footage, chronicling the fair's 100 year legacy. It highlights all six New England states and articulates the ways in which each state contributes to this annual fall tradition. You can watch 100 Years on the Avenue and other great Made Here films streaming on vermontpublic.org and through the PBS app. Enjoy the film, and thanks for watching. The people of New England, the exposition has become a tradition, and it's something that's on their calendar. That first leaf falls, you have a beautiful day in late August, and people even say, it's Big E weather. As you make your way from Vermont to Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, it's like you're taking this little mini trip for in just a few hours, and I don't know of anywhere else in America that one can do that. Looking out the bus, the great big bus that takes the 4-H kids and, you know, even going through the Mass Pike and going through those, those caverns, it looked like to me as a nine-year-old with a car through the mountainside was all part of an adventure that really the Big E, it was quite an eye-opening. It's really the first exposure to the world. Anytime someone or, an, or something turns 100, it's worth celebrating and it's worth celebrating um, appropriately. This is the time to look back, to reflect, to think about from where we've come and where we want to be. Support for 100 Years on the Avenue, the story of the Big E is provided by the contributing viewers of WGBY and by the Chicopee Savings Charitable Foundation. The exposition would not exist if it weren't for Joshua Brooks. Uh, his original idea was to bring together agriculture and industry and all the peoples of New England into this one massive event where we celebrate all that is New England. He was a, a, a strong, commanding individual. People listened to him. He was able to accomplish a great deal to get this off the ground. He recognized that here in, in this region, uh, the farmer was having a hard time competing with large farms that had, were developing out in the Midwest and the Southwest. And he thought that you know he could perhaps build a showcase to amalgamate the efforts of the farming industry here in New England. That original idea has become what we know today as the Big E. And for the past 100 years, these 175 acres in West Springfield, Massachusetts, have been home to New England's great state fair. For 17 days in late summer, people come from throughout the region to experience the rides, taste the food, listen to the music, and watch the animals. It's also an opportunity to celebrate all that New England has to offer. It was an idea that was first hatched back in 1916 and since then, the Big E has become an institution. It's the only fair in the country to have the participation of more than one state. And from the coast of Maine to the shores of Connecticut and beyond, the Big E has been a showcase for agriculture and industry, as well as a reflection of New England's time-honored traditions. In the early part of the 20th century, the Northeast was focused on industry, manufacturing, business, commerce, and most people had all but forgotten about their roots in agriculture. Joshua Loring Brooks seldom did anything without planning. 
In fact, he had carried the idea for an agricultural exposition around in his head for several years before taking action. He left his schooling at Boston University near the end of the 19th century and headed to Western Massachusetts to follow in his father's footsteps of running his own lithography business. He formed the Brooks Banknote Company in Springfield and took up residence in the town of Wilbraham. And once he came here to Western Massachusetts, he fell in love with the um, town of Wilbraham and operated a farm of over 300 acres back when it was extremely rural and mountainous. As a gentleman farmer, he would tell his friends and associates, if the farmer fails to adopt the resources of both science and business, he cannot hold his own. Unless New England farmers are successful, her industries will suffer. Being the persuasive man that he was, Brooks rallied many of his contemporaries to join with him to form the Eastern States Movement. With these things in mind, uh, he hatched the idea of, of this enterprise to protect uh, industry and agriculture uh, for this region, to drive the economy, to build jobs, to make sure you know, people had a, a means by which to make a living. When Brooks decided to launch the first exposition, he wanted it to be big. He had acquired some agricultural land in West Springfield. He then convinced several local business leaders to take a trip to Chicago to try and lure the National Dairy Show to come to West Springfield. Word came to him that the National Dairy Show, based in Chicago, uh, the National Dairy Association people, uh, were not going to be having a show. Uh, there was a terribly contagious disease affecting hundreds and hundreds of cattle. Uh, hoof and mouth disease. Joshua Brooks saw this as a wonderful opportunity. Their loss was Springfield's gain as far as he was concerned. He went to Chicago with a group of men. They, they chartered a railroad, private railroad car, went out to Chicago and actually convinced that board of directors to move a national livestock show here to what was then pretty much a swamp in West Springfield, Massachusetts. And I think it, it took a lot of moxie <laughs> uh, to get that done because when they made the sale, there were no facilities here whatsoever. With only nine months' time, work began on the buildings to host the first fair. A coliseum was built as the centerpiece of the fairgrounds, followed by stables and other side buildings. It was Brooks' vision to create a regional and industrial fair that could provide year-round demonstrations of new farming methods. It would also sponsor some kind of regional cooperation between agriculture and industry. There was entertainment, there was music, uh, the grounds were not laid out yet, and uh, the roadways were pretty primitive. Uh, but people expected that because most roadways were not that sophisticated yet, except for major highways. The 1916 fair was deemed a success, and although the National Dairy Show would never return after that first year, the Eastern States Exposition had been launched, and Brooks' vision for an annual autumn extravaganza had been realized. Attendance that first year reached 45,000 people, and it marked the largest array of purebred dairy cattle ever displayed in a single site, breaking all records set in the Midwest. The outbreak of World War I would interrupt the 1918 fair, as the grounds were used for military purposes. This was a one-year interruption, and by 1919, the grounds were returned to the eastern states, and the plans to grow the fair would move ahead. They pledged assets of their own in order to underwrite the construction of these, uh, the original buildings, which still stand here today. Uh, the Stroh Building, which originally was called the A Barn, uh, the Coliseum, uh, the C Barn, uh, which is our horse barn, uh, the Women's Building, I get a kick out of that name, uh, we, you know, we dutifully changed the name to the New England Center when it became unpopular to have it be called the Women's Building. Providing resources for women had been part of the exposition since the beginning. A women's department was first established and was run by Helen Storrow, the first woman elected to the board of directors of the Eastern States. 
She had the McCall pattern people come in and talking about uh, making clothing for your family or how to use rural electrification or coal in your home as a new resource at that time. Women were told that the electric stove would be the way they'd be cooking. Now this is decades before this happened in your average kitchen, but the newness about it, it was almost like seeing prophecy. Uh, by going to the exposition. As this was also the time where uh, women were looking for the right to vote, and she had an exhibit when they were given the right as to how to vote with paper ballots and voting machines at that time, so women could feel comfortable with their new role. Aside from overseeing the women's department, Helen Storrow was also a preservationist, and in the late 1920s, she looked to create a replica of a New England village at the fair. This village is what we know today as Storrowton Village and sits at the west end of the fairgrounds near the Avenue of States. She paid for all of this. The eastern states did not. It was all her own money uh, looking for the buildings, paying to have them disassembled, paying the carpenters and all the trades to have them put together, that when she passed away uh, in the mid-1940s, it's the trustees that renamed the New England Village after Helen Storrow as an acknowledgement of how much she had given to make this work. Buildings from across New England make up Storrowton Village, including the Gilbert House from West Brookfield, Massachusetts, the Meeting House from Salisbury, New Hampshire, and the Little Red Schoolhouse, whose bell tower was adapted from a schoolhouse in southern Vermont. The village as it came to be was really a fulfillment of her notions of when she was younger of what a New England village should look like. And maybe we don't have the pizzazz and the fireworks of the deep fried pizza martini or whatever it is this year, which I enjoy too. Uh, but we have, that I've talked to, we have the grandchildren of people that came here when they were eight years old that want to come back and say when I came as a school child or when I came during the fair, this is what I experienced. Agriculture has always been at the core of the Eastern State's mission and it continues to be a vital component of the fair today. Livestock competitions happen in the Mallory Complex and farmers young and old come to compete, show and learn. I think we're really, really fortunate to have in New England a show of this caliber. I mean, there are cattle here from all over the Northeast to up into Canada. Kind of a thrill to be involved in it and certainly to get that impartial uh, professional judge's assessment of how our animals stack up against what are really the best in, in North America is pretty, pretty cool. The animal that I showed today's name is Rosalie. I believe there were about 20 in the class and we were fifth. Uh, and we also won a genetic merit award as well, which is just another indication of how she stacks up with those other animals that are really the cream of the cream. The Biggie is a strong supporter of the future farmers of America. Um, this is the only fair in the country where those youngsters come and compete from as many as 15 or more states. That happens here at every fair. Uh, the 4-H competitions, again, very, very critical. The showing of livestock here, um, when you win with your livestock at Eastern States, it's very meaningful and adds value to your uh, animals. 4-H was started as an agricultural program. It's now expanded into science, technology, engineering. Uh, FFA started as an agricultural program and that now encompasses many things. But these kids are brought up in an environment and educated in an environment with leadership, citizenship, and they've learned the responsibility of taking care of an animal or a project from start to finish. Other competitions include landscaping, horticulture, public speaking, and plant identification. The students have to compete first at the state level doing floriculture events with floral design and uh, corsage events. They also have to do a display and then they go to job interview where they teach their life skills, problem solving and customer complaints. So they have to learn to deal with customers. 
They also have a dish garden arrangement that they have to make and design and present it to the judges. As a freshman, there are certain competitions that only you can compete in, and one of them was the FFA Creed written by E.M. Tiffany, and you have to memorize five paragraphs written in 1928, and you recite them in front of an audience. So at state convention, I took first place after reciting it in front of the convention. So I'll go be attending nationals this fall. So I'm in the Little Town Dairy Farmers 4-H Club in Bethlehem, Connecticut, and 4-H stands for the Head, Heart, Hands, and Health. And so, and being involved in 4-H means having all those things come together to come up with a product, which we call our project. So my project is dairy cattle, raise and show them. So it's all about relating the environment, the earth, everything back to dairy and how it connects to our world. Well, I grew up with it. My sister grew up with it. My father used to do it. Actually, I'm pretty sure a lot of the tack boxes we have here are from when he was in 4-H. Um, this is my 11th year in 4-H. It's my last year. Um, I don't know, it's always kind of been natural, something I've always done. I actually want to be an elementary education teacher, um, but I hope to incorporate agriculture into my classroom and still help out on my family farm at home. My aunt is a, has been a dairy farmer her whole life. My parents grew up on a farm. Um, it's something that really interests me, and and it's what I've it's what I've always done. It's what I've grew up on. Um, I, I I wouldn't know how to do anything else. The Coliseum has always been the centerpiece of the West Springfield Fairgrounds, hosting horse and livestock shows since the fair began. Ten 200-foot steel arches form the main support for the building. It was constructed in just under six months and can seat over 5,000 people. The Coliseum was also home to winter sports as professional hockey was played there starting in 1926. My father rented the building from October 1st to May 31st. So anything that went on during that time frame it came under Eddie Shore's auspices. I have he heard people say to me, it's a great place to watch hockey. In fact, it's a great place to watch anything. Ice capades had been coming into the building uh, since 1939-40 season, and one of the skaters I noticed, and I said, hmm, that's nice. So, I got to meet her, and we went out, and eventually got married. Now we've been married over 58 years. Today, it's the horse shows that call the Coliseum home. Horse shows began in Springfield back in 1853, originally held on the grounds of the Springfield Armory. When the Coliseum was built, horses were seen as a good companion to the livestock shows and they began to show at the Big E and have been there ever since. Horses were more, a little more far-reaching. They were a mode of transportation still back in that day. So people came from all over. They came from as far as Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, to come and show here and compete. And, and they would come on the rail cars into the rail station, unload them and walk them across the bridge over here. We don't have a lot of horse shows left in our industry for the show horses where we can show in front of the public and show in front of a crowd. And Eastern States is a, a very special venue. The, the fair, the fact that 100,000 people come through in a day on a Saturday is unheard of. And there's not very many shows left that are able to um, promote our breeds and promote our industry the same way that that horse show can. Ladies and gentlemen, one more look at your champion. There's a lot of history here. There's been some fabulous horses, like you know, several Olympic gold medalists have shown here, not only at the event now, the New England Finals, but at the Big E Horse Show as well, from George Morris to McLean Ward most recently. It's got a great history. There have been very, some of the top hunters and top saddle horses in the last hundred years have shown at the Big E. And this will be exhibitor number two. My family uh, started with the Belgian Draft Horses in 1978. It's a family hobby. I've basically been driving since I was five or six years old and showing as well since I was about eight. The drafts are known for, for their massive size uh, and a mature draft horse is usually between 1,800 and 2,400 pounds. 
the Biggie is a really special place. The first time we were, uh, that we came to the Biggie, we were actually invited to come to participate in the North American Classic Series Finals. And um, we're from New York, we're right between Buffalo and Rochester, and we made the Classic Finals. And uh, so we received an invitation to come to the Biggie for the Classic Finals show, and I believe that was 1998. I think we've only missed one or two years since then. my favorite horse show the, of um, any horse show that I go to and I've been going here I think since I was probably 15 years old with a couple years in between that I haven't and I'm now 34 so almost 20 years I've been coming here. It was a great day. It was <laughs> one of the best days for me in my riding. Um, I won and it was um, an amazing day. Anywhere you go in the world, if somebody were to say, where are you from, and you say from New England, people get a sense of, of, of where you're from. Almost a memory, even if, it, if they've never been here. And they've always had this image, and they don't understand that New England is, is much more than that. It's such a, a mosaic. And the mosaic is what sometimes people have to come here to, to experience. At the Big E, that mosaic of New England is most defined along the Avenue of States. Six replicas of each state's original state buildings come alive during the 17 days of the fair. It was the fair's founder, Joshua Brooks' vision to make the Big E be a regional event. Big E, to my knowledge, is the only place in the country where a state owns a piece of property outside of its own borders. And you can legally claim to have visited the six New England states if you go through these six state buildings um, here at the exposition. The State Building from Massachusetts is a two-and-a-half-story replica of the historic Old State House in Boston. The building was dedicated in September of 1919. This is the first building on the Avenue of States. The legislature voted $50,000 to construct this building back around World War I to showcase Massachusetts agriculture, promote it, promote tourism, promote Massachusetts commerce, and that's what we do here in the building. We have 7,700 farms here in the state um, doing business on uh, half a million acres of land and doing almost half a billion dollars of business every year. The cranberry industry is very much a uh, southeastern part of the state. Apples in central mass. I mean, we have produce really throughout the state. And then once we get out to the Connecticut River Valley, I mean, we have some of the uh, finest soils, not just in the country, perhaps in the world, home of the, the Hadley asparagus, uh, which was uh, the asparagus source for the world at one point in time. We have 150 dairy farms scattered throughout the state, commanding big pastures, fields, and it's a very important part of our economy. And with the space that they, the open space that they command and protect and preserve, uh, it's part of our way of life. We have so much rich geography, history, and everything in such a compact area. From the shores of Cape Cod and our beautiful sandy beaches, it slowly blends into the leafy suburbia, as we call it in the Boston area, you know, those those wealthy genteel towns, and then into some of the more industrialized towns along the rivers, the Worcester area, and heading west, until we get to the garden of the state in the Berkshires and western Massachusetts. It is really an interesting question about how Massachusetts divides itself up because I think it goes from person to person. You know, do you say you're from the South Shore or do you say you're from the town of Plymouth? Do you say you're from Worcester or do you say you're from Central Mass? You know, it really depends on what you identify with as an individual. With the Massachusetts building firmly established on the grounds at the eastern states, Joshua Brooks set his sights on the state of Maine. It was said that he took up residence and camped on the steps of the Capitol in order to convince the Maine legislature to construct a building at the exposition. It took a huge amount of effort to actually get all the states to agree on anything. We've done it rarely since. Put the money into building a building, which was an enormous expenditure of money 100 years ago, and to stay with it. 
I mean, states are famous for having an idea that's four years old until the next election. And so I think that's probably the more remarkable part that you haven't seen the states get away from this concept. As our state slogan says, the way life should be. When you walk into the main building, it's the way life should be. We have great food, long-standing favorites like lobster and blueberries, our state dessert, which is the whoopie pie. And really, when you walk in here, you feel like you're experiencing Maine. So you may be on the biggie grounds, but when you step into the main building, this is your vacation from everything else, and you really get that experience. I think it's a great place to vacation, and it's even a better place to stay. Come for a vacation, stay for a lifetime. We get so many letters at Downey's Magazine about people who say, oh, I love Maine, I wish I could move there someday. And uh, I think it's it, it represents a philosophy, a state of mind that is, in my opinion, something that the world needs more of right now. It's a, it's a wonderful place to live. For us to be able to explore uh, lakes, mountains, woods, true wilderness, and then this beautiful coastline. I mean, there's anything you could possibly want in Maine except maybe warmth in February. <laughs> that's, that's scarce. Maine and Vermont kind of vie back and forth for the largest number of farmers. And um, right now, I think Maine is slightly ahead. We have over 8,000 farms and farm families. You know, we grow crops, dairy, I believe beef isn't as prominent as it was, and sheep certainly not as prominent as it was 100 years ago. You know, the other agricultural products, of course, that we feature are the, are the famous Maine baked potato. And it's not a very high calorie item until you go to work on it and put all the other things. And then you, then you kind of have it, make it into a fair food. And that's, you're, you're allowed to indulge that one day you're at the fair. That's what it's all about. I think other buildings sell lobster, and that's kind of too bad because it really isn't anything like a Maine lobster. You can take some pretty good pictures in Maine and have them on display. And it's, farms are a part of that, certainly the coastline, certainly the forests and the mountains. And so generally when you get here, especially if you get a ways up in the state, you'll be here a while. And that's what we're anxious for people to do. With marble coming from the famous Proctor Vermont Quarry, the Vermont building was next to find a home on the Avenue of States. The building was dedicated on September 17, 1929, and greets thousands of visitors each year during the fair. We really appreciate uh, the other states around us because we all are in this together at some level. But I have to tell you, from a Vermonter's perspective, we're very proud of what we do. We think we have some of the best agricultural products frankly, in the country. We provide over 65% of the fluid milk for all in New England. We're the number one maple producer in the country. We have international and national award-winning cheeses, and we hope people come here to the Big E and taste and touch some of them, and then come to Vermont and share our agriculture heritage um, with us. Well, Vermont's motto, freedom and unity, tells you something about Vermont. It, it balances the idea of individualism and, and uh, do it yourself and go your own way, uh, freedom, with community life, unity. Farming is important to Vermont and New England, not only economically, uh, but uh, culturally as well. Uh, Vermont is what it is today because of uh, its history as a farming state. Uh, it breeds a certain independence and a certain know-how in, in people, and that's important in the Vermont personality. We've always been an agricultural state, and 100 years ago we had dairy then as we do now. Back then we were known for butter production, um, more so than other dairy products, but today we've evolved into a fluid dairy and cheese-making state. Yeah, this is an amazing marketing opportunity for Vermont generally and for Vermont value-added products in particular. We take great pride in what we do in Vermont. We are strong believers in agriculture and our food system, and this helps us share that with the rest of New England and is a great marketing opportunity for not only the vendors who are here, but the, many of the vendors back home. Despite a troubled economy, the New Hampshire building came quickly to the Avenue of States as it was dedicated in September of 1930. 
Like Vermont, New Hampshire showed off its own resources with granite columns and a map built into the entryway to reveal the state's counties and principal cities. What's well, called the Granite State, for a good reason. It was its plutonic, you know, lava that welled up and became the White Mountains and, and so on. I think of it as two or three different states. There's downstate near, near Massachusetts where everybody commutes because they don't want to pay income tax. And then the middle of the state, uh, Concord and uh, Warner and Bradford. Well, there's the White Mountains, uh, vacation spot, the most visited national forest in the country. Uh, millions every year, and then way up north, uh, in what we call the Northeast Kingdom, or what they call Coas County, the Indian Stream Republic, where it peters out into a point. That's a whole different world up there. The thing about agriculture in New Hampshire and about the state itself is how diverse it is. We have rich farmland along some major river valleys. Uh, we have the coastal plain. We have uh, the lakes region. And each area has kind of distinctive um, mix of agricultural enterprises in them. The Avenue of States is, is uh, one of my very favorite parts of, of the Big E and of the grounds. Ours, New Hampshire's, is a replica of the first original New Hampshire State House, and each one is different. You, you really need to go and visit all of the state buildings, but we do tend to think that the New Hampshire building um, is the best. Hey, there's a million and a half people that come through the fair um, over the 17 days, and there aren't too many opportunities to showcase the state to that many people in that short a period of time. So that's what, we're, that's what we're all about, is uh, giving people a, a taste of New Hampshire in many different ways, so that if they weren't familiar with New Hampshire, maybe we've piqued their interest, so they'll come back. And if they were familiar with New Hampshire, then that makes them all the more want to come to, to see us again. With four of the state buildings complete, Joshua Brooks's goal of having all of New England represented at the fair was well on its way. Connecticut was next in line, but those plans would be interrupted slightly due to the floods of 36 and the hurricane of 38. The hurricane of 38 hit right in the middle of the exposition's run on September 20th and halted the exposition. The uh, damage was quite devastating. Villers was actually underwater to the point of midway to the second floor of this building. So our law office and our schoolhouse and our blacksmith shop and half of the uh, depth of our meeting house, which is already on raised ground, was underwater. Built at a cost of $75,000, the Connecticut building was constructed in 1938. This was the fifth building to be added to the Avenue of States, and it features brownstone brick and dignified wooden columns. Connecticut has a lot in a small package. It really has all sorts of geography, all sorts of landscape, 100 miles of shoreline. We have mountains, people think mountains. They may not be as spectacular as the Adirondacks, but we do have mountains. And there's really a lot of difference uh, in different parts of the state, partially based on its geography and partially based on who lives there. The landscape is farmed mostly by dairy farmers. Uh, so they, they farm about 70,000 acres across the state. On the shoreline, we ha also have Long Island Sound, and the largest farm that we have here in the state of Connecticut happens to be underwater. So we're, we're cultivating and harvesting hard-shelled clams and oysters. Connecticut's kind of unique. The land here is so rocky. People who settled here from the, a European background had to go around and pick up all the stones and clear the fields before they could do any planting or harvesting. You may have noticed all of our stone walls on campus, and if not, uh, people comment on those, and they're a historic treasure. The university is known as the home of Augustus and Charles Storrs, the two brothers. Augustus gave the land to the university in perpetuity as long as there was a school of agriculture. And should there not be a school of agriculture, the land reverts to his family. And, and someone commented to me, well, there's probably no family left. That was the 18, 
uh, late 1880s. And in reality, the Storrs family is still a prominent family here in Eastern Connecticut. We take seriously the opportunity uh, to manage the Connecticut building in a way that highlights and promotes Connecticut businesses, including farmers and farming. And this year, we featured uh, 17 uh, different wines and a good number, a high percentage of our farm wineries, which has been very helpful to them and gives uh, visitors to the Big E an opportunity to experience some of what we're growing here in Connecticut and the value-added products that we have made available to them. History is everywhere you go, whether you're walking in New Haven and you're looking at those churches on the green or the architecture of Yale University, or whether you're on a town green in some small town in the quiet corner and you see the congregational church and you look at the stone walls, and there's really a sense of we've been here a long time and we stay here because we love it here. The outbreak of World War II would have a tremendous impact on the grounds of the eastern states, and the fair was put on hold. The Army Quartermaster took control of the grounds for wartime purposes. The Coliseum would be used for storage, and Storleton Village would house military personnel. The United States government was going to be using all of the grounds, all of the buildings, and they started to stockpile their own goods piled to the ceiling of the Coliseum. Storton Village, those beautiful homes, became the barracks. The state buildings were shut down completely with no maintenance, no repair at all. And it took them a long, long time to get everything repaired and cleaned and put to better order it was extremely costly, and the show did go back on, and people were thrilled. And it was a new day, and the war was over, and they looked ahead. The return of the fair would be overshadowed by the death of Joshua Brooks in 1949. He was mourned by many as one of the community's sturdiest civic leaders. And although the success of the Eastern States Exposition already served as the finest living memorial to its founder, it was decided to construct a new administration building in his honor. The Brooks Building would make it possible for the headquarters of the Eastern States to be moved from downtown Springfield to the fairgrounds in West Springfield. The 1950s would usher in a new era at the fair as attendance continued to grow. The 1953 fair had as its centerpiece a visit from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Never before had a president come to the fair during his term in office. Dwight D. Eisenhower was still in the early part of his first term. Eisenhower went and had a good time. He really, there, there are pictures of him looking like he was enjoying himself, intermingling with people. So he liked it, I guess it was a side to him that people rarely got to see, and he showed it while he was there at the fair. Prior to his death in 1949, Joshua Brooks had donated a generous sum of money toward the construction of a Rhode Island building and the completion of his dream of having all six New England states represented on the fairgrounds. In 1957, that dream was realized as a two-story replica of Newport's old state house was dedicated. Big E is an amazing draw for tourism. 1.4 million consumers come through these gates every year. Last year we saw 1.1 million people come through our doors here at the Rhode Island House. We have you know, amazing things from mussel soup over at Duffy's to these amazing clam cakes here at Kenyon's uh, Gristle House. And uh, we, you know, people love them. I mean, clam cakes are you know, a summer staple. For a small state, it's incredibly varied. You go from the, the shore towns in the south to like the old mill town of Woonsocket in the north. But it's fascinating for me when I was a columnist, how I had access to pretty much the whole state in a way. That I could get to a place that I needed to within an hour, um, that somebody would know, somebody who could connect me with what I needed. Um, it's always been that way. 400 miles of coastline. 
which it's the ocean state, but I think that always surprises people that it really, we've got, you know, beaches from top to bottom and they are beautiful. The number of farms in the state has grown dramatically in the past 12, 15 years. In fact, one of the highest percentage increases in the, in the country. For many years, we were kind of the center of sod in New England, and we still have a significant sod industry. The center of the state is Narragansett Bay. It's an ocean-moderated climate, a lot of farmland around the bay. I would dare say we probably have some of the best seafood in New England. Maybe I'll get some pushback on that, but I'll make put my stake in the ground right there. It's a great place for little spots. It's a great place for little, like the best clam shack, as you say, or, you know, um, the best calamari in Rhode Island, and I can tell you where that is if you want to know. To me, there's, there's a, a certain energy that goes with being a small state, very collaborative, very unsiloed. It, it brings something that's different to the table, and I think that's something that we can certainly work with and promote. We view the fair itself not just in, through the lens of the Rhode Island building, but its value in, in educating and helping people understand uh, agriculture, where their food comes from, and there's a lot of value to that. A lot about the fair is tradition. We have five generations of farmers in the barns at any given moment. Uh, we also probably have some, some of our employees might be third generation employees. And it's the same for the fair goer. This is a place where, you know, young, I grew up coming here as a child. My father and, and mother were, were young people when they first came to the fair. And the tradition permeates really every aspect of the fair. It was the Springfield Fair. It was the exposition, the Eastern States, the fair at Springfield. Uh, West Springfield got lost somewhere along the way. And then finally, it was decided in modern context uh, to just call it the Big E. I've been coming to the fair since I was a very little girl. My father worked here as a mobile policeman. For me, as, as much as I love the fair, it means family and it means memories. And we oftentimes come on the last day just kind of to walk around and sort of say goodbye. You know, it's, it's the end of summer, it's the end of fall, you know, winter's coming and it's, it's like West Springfield seems to come alive during the Big E, you know, and, and I miss it when it's gone. I really do. And as a child, uh, we would make that annual trek in September to Eastern States uh, because it was viewed as uh, the highlight of the fall, fall harvest and all that was agriculture in this part of the world. And our family here at Breguin Farms has been exhibiting dairy cattle at Eastern States continuously in the Holstein show. And for me, it was an opportunity to work alongside the family and, and do something that we all enjoyed. Normal people have hobbies or take vacations. We went to cow shows when I was growing up or went to other dairy events. So the Big E was a, a huge part of that, really. The meeting place for everybody is in front of the big slide because it's the easiest thing to find. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And that's where we first met. A friend of ours snapped the picture because they just thought it was so cute that we hit it off and we were holding hands already and we were just having a really great time. The yep. second year we, we went, we decided to start holding up our the previous year's picture. Yeah, and that was totally her idea. Yeah. And then this was just this last year, so we got sort of a whole tunnel this effect going on. This past year, yeah. So, it's, so this, is, um, this is our third year anniversary. And uh, we always meet in front of the big slide, usually with generally the same kind of group of friends. Yep. It's kind of cute. So now, yeah, I can't even imagine that we would skip a year. Because, no. you know, we got to keep the tradition. Going. We've joked, even if we move away, we'd have to come back <laughs> just to take our picture. <laughs> you and me and the big yellow slide. And that was my favorite. I remember when I was just old enough where my head fit over the, the line, you know, where I could ride the ride. And they give you the burlap bag. You know, you go running up a hundred and something steps and slide down, and it's it's happiness.
Entertainment has been a staple at the fair since the beginning, and for many, that's what brings them to the Big E. The daily parade winds its way through the fairgrounds in the late afternoon. It's a tradition that dates back over 50 years. In the year 2000, the Big E introduced a Mardi Gras style parade, a New Orleans themed idea complete with floats, music, and of course, beads. Well, initially, um, a lot of people thought, you know, is that going to be a good fit? You know, New Orleans and New England. Um, and they said, you know what, maybe that's why we should try it. And of course, throwing the beads uh, became part of the culture. Um, I think we th throw somewhere around 400,000 uh, strands of beads during the 17 days. We thought that it would be a phenomenon for perhaps two or three years. Um, it became much, much bigger uh, with a public than I ever anticipated. And today, it would be very difficult, I think, to take it out of the exposition's entertainment. I think a lot of people would be very unhappy. As I look back on some of the history of the Big E, you see all kinds of entertainment, whether it, it was a, a big band playing in the, in the Coliseum, and it might be a, the Navy band or the Marine band or something like that, or a big band era. Back in the, in the 60s, you know, we had Diana Ross and the Supremes were, were here, and, and, the, and the story goes that not many people showed up. They didn't believe she was going to be here. It's a huge component now because there's so many different genres of music. You know, back then it was kind of country or country <laughs> or maybe a little bit of rock and pop or so. You know, we booked, we booked somebody like Fergie, you know, at, at the height of her career. She was the biggest star in the world. Uh, Jessica Simpson, also another huge star. Charlie Daniels was a guy that uh, really treated me very well when I first got in the business. He was one of the first acts that we had booked here in, in the early 80s. Destiny's Child, when they were nobody at all. Beyonce, she was just a kid when she came here. And she was wonderful, she was just a great kid. And, and think of where she is today. We had Mickey Dolans here one day from the Monkees. And he, we drove him up, uh, he put, played in front of the Coliseum. We drove up, he got out of the car, he went right into the Coliseum. And I'm like, where the heck is he going? The stage is out front. And I went in with him, I said, Mickey, everything all right? He goes, I played this building in the 60s on like a Dick Clark tour with Herman's Hermits and the Dave Clark Five. And it, it just brought back a lot of memories to him. And the Big E Circus Spectacular. I uh, actually um, developed the circus in 1970. At that time, we did an indoor production in the Coliseum. It became so successful, and the Coliseum was not in, uh, available, really, for the duration of the fair, so we decided to put it under uh, a big top. And it's a great environment because people are no more than 50 feet from the action in that one ring European style uh, circus. And over the years, um, it's become an iconic event here. Um, 75 to 80,000 fair goers go to it over the 17 day period of time. Stars in show business entering into the friendly mood of the exposition. Arthur Godfrey was a part of the horse show here at Eastern States Exposition. He showed his horses, and of course he was a, a very, very big celebrity at the time. So he, he became kind of an integral to what we were doing at the time, and we even used himself, his likeness and his voice in some of our promotional films that were done at the time. There was one called The Show Window of the East that he just delivered. Yes, this is The Show Window of the East. And what a show window. So it's kind of um, nice to have people like that that are part of our history. Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and Trigger were here as well, Liberace and some of the, the greatest names in show business. They had the Stuart and Music Tent. They had some Broadway traveling shows. Perry Como and Bob Hope was here a lot. You would see these people on television and all of a sudden you had your chance to see this person in the flesh and it really contributed to the allure of not only the fair, but also of Greater Springfield. I grew up on Chuck Berry's music, and uh, one year we had a, a great opportunity to bring him here, and I looked out the window that afternoon in between performances, and I noticed that Chuck, who had driven himself here from New York, no entourage, was in his car driving through the fairgrounds. Now, this is in the middle of the afternoon, so I went dashing out the door to find out what, where was Chuck Berry going, driving his Cadillac uh, down one of the main streets here. Come to find out, he decided he wanted a hot dog. He thought he'd go get it himself. <laughs> 
The grounds of the exposition have survived storms, floods, wars, and financial challenges. It has grown well beyond a fair to encompass many facets of New England life. In 2001, just three days before the opening of the fair, America suffered its worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil. With many activities across the country put on hold, then Eastern States President Wayne McCary had a big decision to make. My own philosophy was that the Big E really represented in, in many ways the spirit of America and it was the intent of terrorists to compromise our way of life. So if there was a way that we could not cave into their agenda, it would be a good thing. Uh, over a million people came. Uh, it was a somber fair, a much, much different fair than any other that I've been associated with. But I, I will never forget the first parade that went down the Avenue of States. We had passed out individual little flags. And, and uh, you saw people, all of us, with tears in our eyes, um, but bringing together people and seeing the youngsters with their bands. You know, you had confidence that this country would survive and that this country would rise up again and, and confront whatever hardships it had. Every morning at 10 a.m., they play the national anthem. And everybody on this street that goes by stops. Everybody that's around the firehouse, because that's where the flag is, in front of the firehouse, stops, puts their hand over their heart, and listens to the national anthem being sung. And at the end of it, everybody claps. And I, I just, I'm old enough to appreciate the fact that that had gone away for a while, that people, there were years when people would just walk right by, the anthem would be playing, nobody acknowledged it. And in the, since September 11th, um, that has changed dramatically. And I like that part of it. For many, no trip to the Big E is complete without a sampling of food. Tasty treats like candy apples, cotton candy, and social whirls were staples in the early years. Friendly Ice Cream had many versions of their famous restaurants on the grounds. And on the Avenue of States, the main baked potato became so popular, the building had to be renovated to accommodate the huge lines. One of the oldest food establishments on the fairgrounds is Yankee Boy, whose history dates back to the mid-20s. Well, from what I understand, it goes back to 1926, to when my grandfather first started here. And I think at that time, it was probably just a few hot dog stands he had. I think they were intense, he said, back then. It's a tradition. Uh, it, uh, we take a lot of pride being here. We, I think it's a privilege to be able to be here so many years. And uh, it's just something that, uh, it's in your blood. We started out back in 61, and we started out with just a tent with sawdust on the ground, and uh, and they were $1.75 for a meal then, and it was like uh, half a chicken, french fries, salad roll, and your beverage, it all came together. I'm an old, carny guy, and I love the Big E. I love the fair. I love coming down and working for the Lions Club. Certainly one of the big reasons that people come to the exposition uh, is for food, the wide variety of it. Definitely, uh, food's part of the fun. And each year, we try to come up with something that's, you know, fun, but still appetizing. Deep fried strawberry shortcake, beer amisu, which was really good, you'll have to try that. The crazy burger, it's a hamburger with bacon on it, cheese, and instead of buns, you have a honey glazed donut. So cream puff is, uh almost non-fattening, but it's, uh, we make everything fresh. The dough is made fresh. We use a very heavy cream, put a little powdered sugar on top of it, and that's what it is. It's, uh, it's good and it's rich. My wife's family was in the ice cream and what they call grab business, hot dogs, hamburgers, and like that. And they started a pizza business years ago, and we just kind of fell into it and we go from Erie County Fair in Buffalo, New York, to Syracuse, 
to here, to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to Raleigh, North Carolina, and we try to be home for Halloween. There's a good blend of local people here that I've known for years, and it gets a chance for us to, to visit, too. It's a way of life, not a job. One hundred years is a milestone, and over that time, the Eastern States has never lost sight of its original roots, established by Joshua Brooks back in 1916. To promote agriculture and industry, education and commerce, and provide families and individuals the opportunity to celebrate the American way of life and all that is great about this region we call home. If you've attended the Big E or any of the events held on the grounds of the Eastern States, you've helped keep that mission alive. The more, you know, high tech our environment becomes, our work life becomes, is still something I think within all of us that we want to reach out and touch something real. And I, I think the exposition kind of brings so many different experiences that are real uh, to the public and that's what they embrace and I, I think as you, you know as you're looking forward uh, with the exposition, the exposition I think will be successful for years to come because of that. I was raised in the livestock industry and I'm here to ensure that the level of competition at this fair stays where it is. This is my 63rd fair. I walk by a picture that hangs in the hallway of Mallory every morning. It's my dad. And I just want him and everybody to know that I carry this on. Everybody has a reason for wanting to come here. Tradition, food, but there's the rides. and So we use all of that sort of a glitz and glamour, the lights and the, and the noise to attract uh, people to the fair. And really we do all that in order to sustain our investment in the proliferation and propagation of agriculture. We've hit a great milestone at 100 years. And uh, this year, having the opportunity to look back on our 100th anniversary, you know, now we can look forward with great excitement towards the next 100 years. Support for 100 Years on the Avenue, the story of the Big E is provided by the contributing viewers of WGBY, and by the Chicopee Savings Charitable Foundation.